one of the delights of doing environmental work at MSU is you get to work with leaders who are not only academic leaders uh, helping this, this place move forward, but who are also very deep thinkers on these issues, uh, who have a lot of insights, who uh, understand what the issues are, and have a lot to contribute intellectually as well as through their leadership. Um, I need to apologize for the music. We keep telling them to turn it off. But, uh, I'm not sure what's happening, but hopefully we will get that resolved. So, uh, we now move on with the program. Um, and the first speaker is Jeff Andreessen, uh, who will be speaking on climate change in Michigan, impacts and adaptation, uh, a perfect follow one. Um, Jeff is uh, uh, in the department formerly known as uh, geography, but we'll attempt to get the department name correct. But Jeff is the state climatologist. He is a climatologist and meteorologist in terms of his own research and training. He is the state climatologist, and he is also uh, the MSU leader of the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center, GLISA. GLISA is a joint center between MSU and the University of Michigan. We, we do cooperate. Uh, it is funded by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and it is one of 10 centers around the United States funded by NOAA. The purpose of each of these centers is to take the science we have about climate change and to make it available to folks who need to develop strategies to adapt to climate change. So Glisa does a wide variety of projects. Glisa, we're now in our seventh year? Eighth year. Uh, again, with, with NOAA funding, for which we're very grateful, and we hope we'll continue. Um, and does projects all through the Great Lakes region, again, to try to bring science um, to bear on problems of climate adaptation. And Jeff knows more about Michigan's climate and how it's changing than I think anybody else in the world, actually. And so I'm very happy to turn to Jeff, who's been a good friend and colleague for years. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, kind intro. As Tom has mentioned, uh, I'd like to start at least uh, from a, a climate perspective. And there, there actually are several, several pieces of the uh, symposium here today that deal directly with adaptive measures, climate change being one of those. Uh, I'm going to talk here, at least to begin with, and what, uh, on, a, uh, on a bright, sunny Saturday morning about where we are, really a status check on, on our climate and what we've observed and what's projected. Uh, there is uh, there's some, some very, very interesting and, and concerning, I would say, true troubling trends, uh, relationships, I think, that are worth, worth reviewing here. But uh, try to give you a, a status update as to where things are uh, uh, the latest that we have. And here. I'm going to start with uh, basically looking in the rearview mirror. Uh, it's a historical trends. I also want to spend some time. One of the one of the issues that we know relatively less about, but is very very important in terms of adapt, adapt uh, adapting to uh, external forcing and climate change. Oh, It suits your, your purpose. Uh, I'd like to start with some uh, discussion of, of where we've been here over the last, uh, especially over the last few decades, uh, and then spend some time with, with climatic variability. And uh, that's a, 
uh, well, I'll, I'll get there in a little bit, and then end with some projections. I do have some examples of some adaptive strategies uh, that are that are interesting, and, and uh, sometimes whether people even know it or not, or like it or not, uh, people are, many of our uh, communities, organizations are already taking measures to adapt to changes. And if we were going to do a 60 second version of at least, uh, both, actually both uh, our historical and projected future, the summation would be warmer and wetter. Uh, that's, the, that's the very, very uh, brief version. I'll, I'll add some, some detail onto that or meat onto that. But I want to start by looking at a, a series of, of global temperatures. And uh, some of you have probably have seen this. This is uh, from NOAA, and this goes back to 1880, back to the end of the 19th century. And what you're looking at here, and you're going to see a number of, of images like this. Uh, these are global temperatures expressed as the difference between the mean global temperature that year, and this is both land surface and ocean combined. So it's all of the temperature measured. And these are, these are separated out as the highest quality uh, observations that we have over the record. And each of these years is expressed as the difference between the global temperature that year and a long-term mean, which in this case is defined as 1901 to 2000. So a 100-year mean, and if, uh, if those uh, numbers are below zero or less than zero and they're blue, it's cooler than that long-term average, and of course the reds are the opposite. And what you can see clearly, the, the Earth is warm. There is just, uh, we could have probably, maybe 20 years ago, we probably could have debated that still a little bit, but there is no longer any debate about that at all. Uh, this goes through, technically, through 2017. The final data from last year, from 2018, are not, well, we have a preliminary version, but the, the final version is not available, but it's, it probably will be up here. So 2018 will be the fourth warmest year uh, globally on record, uh, and of, of all of the four warmest years that we have on record have been the last four years. Uh, 2016, or at this point in time, is, is the warmest. Uh, 2018 is the 42nd consecutive year of above normal temperatures. And again, thinking about that 100-year mean. Uh, 1977, way back here, is the last year that we saw a negative departure from this. And, uh, collectively here, we've got an increase in global temperatures somewhere a little bit over a 1 degree Celsius, so a couple degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> that doesn't sound like much, and if I, I would be challenged, as many of you probably would be as well, to even distinguish a two degree Fahrenheit temperature change. But when we look at over a large, large area globally here and over long periods of time, what we know is that this is a very, very significant change, uh, certainly in, in a climatological sense and also in a, in a geological time frame sense. It's a, uh, a significant warming over a relatively short period of time. And that's, I'm going to come back to that as well. The rate of change is important here as well. Why is this change occurring? Well, some of it could be natural variability. That's, uh, that's one of the things we, we, climate has varied since the beginning of, uh, of, of Earth. It always has and it always will. However, there is unquestionably a human fingerprint uh, with this, associated with this warming. And of course, most of that is associated with changes in our atmospheric constituents, notably carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, and there are a host of other so-called greenhouse gases that allow the Earth or keep the Earth significantly warmer than it would be without an atmosphere. Dr. Wipa mentioned uh, looking at, at uh, a, a planet without a moon or without an atmosphere at the moon, and, and it's essentially very, very hot on the sunlit side and, and, and the opposite on the dark side. Uh, the Earth is a special place because of that atmosphere. The problem is is that uh, humans, by taking carbon that has been fixed in the Earth's crust for millennia, uh, long, long, long time, releasing it, oxidizing it, and putting it into the atmosphere, it changes the radiative properties of our atmosphere. Uh, it's, it, and I think the, the best analog that I've, I've heard on that is it's, it's essentially like putting on an extra blanket uh, that we would have, that we would we'd use, and essentially that blanket helps keep a little bit of the energy that our bodies generate within. The same thing is true for the Earth itself. And if you actually look at these numbers, I'm, I'm going to have a uh, little bit of physics here and what's going on, but the concentrations of these greenhouse gases obviously have been rising since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution uh, here almost 200 years ago. 
uh, and they are projected to rise, increase in the future. And as that happens, what we're doing again is we are decreasing the amount of energy that's allowed to escape back out to space. And our, our Earth climate system is a, uh, it's an energy, there's an energy balance associated with it, and, and a little bit of the energy is trapped in. Now, if you went up to the top of the atmosphere, and you averaged over the entire globe, what you'd find is that the energy coming in from the sun balanced with what's going out, that balance is around 240 watts per meter squared. So some of you that uh, have had, remember back in your, your physics class and so forth, that's not a whole lot. But again, over such a large area, it's, it's a massive amount of energy. The sun dominates, the energy coming in from the sun dominates all other forms of energy in, in our climate system. And it turns out that what's happening as a result of these increasing gas concentrations we're increasing the amount of, of forcing, the, the amount of energy ranges from around 2 watts per meter squared to maybe as much as 8 watts per meter squared. And that's what's projected to happen over the next several decades. Again, 1, 2, 3 percent or so. It's not much, but when it's over such a large area, it's a very, very profound change. And as that heat is trapped in our system, the, the result is a, a warming of, of the Earth's surface. That's the, the, the theory on it is very, very strong and very, very clear. And we also have uh, ample empirical evidence looking at our own, our, our geologic history. This is a, a uh, time series here. It's, it goes backwards in time, starting from the present, back 150,000 years. This was taken from ice, core, uh, ice cores in Antarctica. But what you're looking at here is the uh, correlation between atmospheric concentrations of CO2 here in blue and then uh, temperatures air temperatures at the same time. And as you can see, there's a very, very strong and clear correlation between the two. And note, sometimes the increase in, in the carbon dioxide concentration precedes the warming. Sometimes, not always the case. It can be both ways. There are a number of reasons for that, but it has to do with this, the cycling, again, of nitrogen and carbon in the, the uh, Earth's balance. But the other thing to note here, too, is that these, these changes typically take place over very long periods of time. What we're seeing in the last century is something very, very rapid uh, relative to, to past historical changes. So uh, again, there is a, a large scale forcing out there and, and many of the changes we've seen are associated with human activity. But what about Michigan? What about the Great Lakes region? And I'll start with mean annual temperature. So this is taking uh, basically all of the, the days of the year and averaging them together with the maximum temperatures from all of the stations in the state. These series that you're going to see, many of these start in the late 19th century, 1895, when we start to have reliable records and going up through last year. And you can see that Michigan and the Great Lakes region, the upper Midwest for that matter, are, are warming. Uh, it's, uh, but there are some, some variants or some variability, periods of variability in here. You can see that there was warming early on last century of about a degree Fahrenheit. That was followed by a slow cooling trend of the same magnitude, about a degree Fahrenheit, that lasted until 1980 or so. And then since 1980, uh, our mean annual temperatures have warmed about 2 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, again, a little less or a little more than 1 degree Celsius. One other thing that you can see here, too, the individual black dots are the values for that year. This uh, red line here is a nine-year moving average, and it smooths out. It's meant to see some of the longer decadal type time, frame, uh, time trends that we see. Uh, but it's interesting to note here, especially looking at the last uh, several decades here, that this warming is not symmetrical around the year. Some seasons have warmed uh, relatively more than others. One last thing, too, on this, if you look at the spread of these individual years around that, that mean, you could make the argument that the last 10 or 20 years, the interannual variability has increased. And again, I'm going to get to this issue of variability. It's a big deal in terms of, of what we as humans and what society does about this. But increasing variability is a difficult thing sometimes to, uh, to deal with. So I mentioned the, uh, this two degree warming, or really this, the recent warming is not symmetrical about the seasons. It turns out most of it, and if you do the arithmetic, uh, more of it has occurred during the cold season during, than during the warm season. All of the seasons have, have shown increases, but it's been less in the winter and in the spring. And there's another, even another interesting piece of that. It turns out that our minimum temperatures, our overnight temperatures, have risen more quickly than the daytime temperatures. So the diurnal range, the difference between the maximum and temperature, that has decreased or shrunk uh, or a little bit is reduced 
uh, over the last couple decades. This is a this series is looking now just at the months of December, January, February, our winter mean temperatures, and you can see a clear upward trend here for uh, for Michigan. But there is a caveat here, and for those of, that have been here for the last several years, you know we have had some very very we've had some severe winters, and, and there's no other word for it. 2013, 2014, right here, uh, that was followed by 2014, 15, and we also had a colder than normal winter this year. Uh, it was mostly during the latter part of the season, but there's been a bit of a leveling off of this pattern, which I think is, is quite interesting and has, certainly has ramifications for a number of both natural and human systems. But the long-term trend, while that is still upward, there has been a leveling off of this, this uh, cold season warming, at least during the past decade. Again, you could make a, a case, I think, here for a little bit more variability. We've had some very mild winters in the last decade, but we've also had some very cold ones. I'll, I'll get back to that. One of the, one of the unquestionable results of, of milder winters is uh, the amount and the duration of ice on the Great Lakes, which surround us. The, uh, well, by area, it's the largest volume, or the largest uh, area of fresh water in the world. 21% uh, 20, I believe of the world's fresh water is in the Great Lakes, and they surround us literally here, uh, during the winter time, uh, ice has been a normal part of the ice on, ice off of, of the uh, annual cycle here. But if we look, these are these blue bars here are the uh, total ice cover across the Great Lakes as measured by satellite. This, this series only goes back to 1980, 81, uh, and this, this one ends in 2016-17. We would be back up above normal here if we included up through the, the most recent year. But the long-term trend here uh, again, is still downward, but again, the caveat, here's 13, 14, and 14, 15, there have been a couple winters with extraordinary, very, very, very cold. Uh, again, if you think about 2013, 14, that was, those two winters, by the way, uh, climatologically, were the most severe back-to-back -back winters uh, in our region since over 100 years. It was, you had to go back to uh, 19, 1911 and 12 last century, so it's a long time since we've had two back-to-back -back like that, and that's the ice cover during those winters shows up here. So again, the, the maybe the point here is the long-term trend is still downward, but the variability uh, from year to year has, has certainly increased uh, in recent time. There have also been noticeable and measurable changes in seasonality in our climate here. This is a bit of a mess uh, in this graphic here. Uh, bear with, there are three series on here. The, the green line here is the change in the timing of the last freezing temperatures of the spring season. This is the group, this is a six state average here we're, we're looking at. Uh, so we have days here on our vertical axis and once again years on the horizontal axis. And what you can see really over the last uh, few decades here is that the timing of that last freeze of the spring has tended to occur earlier by about a week or even a little bit more with time. The blue line here is the timing of the first freeze of the fall. So on the, the back side of the growing season, that's tending to occur a little bit later in the fall than it has in the past. And then the red here is the amount of frost free growing season in between. And what you can see pretty easily here uh, is that we have added somewhere on the order of about a week and a half of frost free growing season to, uh, on, on average, that we did not have just 30 or 40 years ago in Michigan. That's a, that's a pretty profound change. We've looked at this in more detail in Michigan. Uh, it is not symmetrical here. There's been more change in the spring here than there has been in the fall. So the, the seasonal warm-up occurring in the spring now is, is, in most places, at least a week and a half earlier on average. Doesn't mean we won't see uh, uh, something very odd in one year, but on average, it's occurring at least a week and a half earlier than it did just, just 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, there's still some change in the fall, but most of this uh, in Michigan has occurred in the spring. One implication, if, uh, if well, we, Michigan is the leading producer of tart cherries, uh, certainly in the United States, it's one of the leading producers in the world for that matter. And uh, as a perennial uh, cold-blooded organism, uh, it responds to changes in its environment. And, uh, and why this is important is that those changes in season have, have an impact on all, of all these overwintering crops. And what you're looking at here for tart cherries, and this is from from Traverse City up in the northwest, we're going to see a couple of, of images from this. This is 
in, uh, was a, from a project I was involved with a couple of years ago looking at the influence of climate and shifts and changes in climate on tart cherry production in the state. It turns out that when tart cherries are fully dormant, they can withstand a lot of abuse in terms of cold temperatures, minus 25, maybe even minus 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, below zero. They can, they, but when, the, when development begins, when they respond to the warming of the season, that resilience drops off rapidly, dramatically. And so by the time you get to the so-called side green stage here, that damage threshold, instead of being minus 25 Fahrenheit, you're now talking about maybe plus 22, 23 degrees. And as the fruit goes into its uh, regular budding and bloom stage, it gets all the way up to the upper 20s. And it turns out for, for most food crops, the, the largest uh, environmental, or at least the largest climatological constraint is water, either the, the uh, surplus abundance or the lack of water describes most of the variability of productivity, not with these crops. With these crops, it's all about spring freezes. And for those of you who remember 2012, uh, in, in Michigan and Great Lakes, actually it was, it was region-wide, we had an unprecedented heat wave in the month of March, uh, which had never, the likes of which have never been observed before. It not only was it the warmest March on record, it was the largest departure of any month in our climatic record above normal. Uh, very, very unusual. And what happened with these overwintering crops at that point, of course, they all responded to the warm-up, thought it was spring, uh, buds formed. For the first time in history, uh, cherries bloomed in the month of, of March, and they've been grown in Michigan successfully for 150 years. Uh, that had never been observed before, but it happened in 2012. And then by the end of March, and continuing on into April, uh, the weather and the weather reverted back to the normal in Michigan, uh, and which of course is more late winter uh, than early spring. There was a series of 15 to as many as 20 freeze events, and it, it just it basically destroyed are uh, not just cherries, apples, peaches, blueberries, uh, grapes. They were all, there were very, very few, there was very, very little crop in that uh, particular year. And if you look at this, again, this is the day that the, that the during the year, so uh, day 91 would be, uh, 92 would be the beginning of April, uh, day 122 would be the beginning of May, from 1 to 365. And in northwestern lower Michigan, this, this stage you can see historically has been reached in that first week of May or so, but it's been getting earlier with time. Think back about what we just saw with the spring warm-up, but especially over the last, again, 30 to 40 years. There's a, there's a discontinuity there around 1980, there's 2012, nothing else touches that. That's a, and if, if you're a fruit grower, you don't even want to hear the, the term, the, or the year 2012, but you can see that there's a clear trend towards earlier in the season. So that's, this is, this is not just, the, and this is an agricultural crop, but this is also true for our natural uh, ecosystems too and landscapes. They're responding to the same force. You could ar make a very, very strong argument uh, in terms of climatic trends though, that the most significant trend that we, we have observed here, uh, especially over the last half century, is uh, more precipitation, more annual precipitation. That's what you're looking at right here. Again, back to 1895 through the end of last year, uh, and you can see, well, a couple of things here. The 1930s show up as the benchmark driest decade or driest uh, period here on our, our climate record. But ever since the 1930s, uh, our climate has become wetter. And there is a little bit of seasonal variability here, but uh, suffice to say, this is, this is one of the strongest and, and most uh, consistent trends we have across the region is more annual precipitation. You can see that the last decade is the wettest on record, so you've got the 30s as the driest. We have added, if you're, you're interested in how much, uh, somewhere on the order of three to four inches of additional water we have now that we did not have just 50 or 60 years ago. And uh, I guess to put that in a different perspective, our normal precipitation during a summer month, and, and Michigan has most of this precipitation during the warm season relative uh, maximum warm season, it's adding a whole month of additional precip now that we had that we did not have before. And there are many, many, many impacts associated with that. Uh, many of them positive. Certainly for agriculture, that is true. And I'm gonna I'm gonna illustrate a, a couple of those. But there are two ways that you can get more annual precipitation. One of them of course is to have more wet days, more days with precipitation. That's happening. 
That's increased in some cases by as much as 30%, but we're also getting more precipitation per event, especially heavy events. And this, uh, this graphic here from Sarah Pryor's group in Indiana a few years ago, uh, on the upper right here, this is the trend in, uh, this is what happens, or what, what it looks like if you take the 10 largest precip events, daily precip events uh, uh, each year, add those up, and what you're looking at here is the trend in the sum of those large events. And reds are increases in uh, that sum. Blues are decreases. And again, over most of the region, the vast majority of the region, we have seen clear increases. So we're getting both more wet days and more, more precipitation per event. Both of that is occurring. Snowfall is a little bit of an interesting one. Uh, this two graphics here, we're comparing two different time frames. On the left, we're looking at mean seasonal snowfall for 30 year period 1961 to 1990. And then on the right side, you're looking at the current normals period for uh, internationally, which is defined as 1981 to 2010. These are our current normals. And there are two changes relative change to one another that illustrate trends in, in snowfall. I don't know if anybody can see, it's a little bit of a, of a game here. One is, one is difficult to see, but that is, and I'll tell, I'll tell you that right now, is that snowfall, seasonal snowfall in areas to our south, especially as we get towards the Ohio Valley, has decreased. You can see the, that this line here has moved closer. There are even parts of southeastern lower Michigan that fit into this, this category, but in contrast, you have other areas like the Upper Peninsula, the Northwestern Lower, where seasonal snowfall has increased with time. And we usually don't see these types of things in, our, in a region like this. We usually see consistent patterns. But here, there, there are two different trends going on. It, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. And it relates back to some of what we've already talked about. It turns out what's, what's happening here with, with the increases in the snowfall, you, you probably know the answer to this already, but it's lake effect. It's lake effect snowfall. Areas down here to our south and west, most of the, the vast majority or nearly all of the snowfalls associated with synoptic snowfall, system snowfall. That's true here in East Lansing as well. But in places like, uh, like Antrim County uh, and in the, the Upper Peninsula, a, a large portion of their snowfall is associated with the lakes. And basically more lake effect, so the, the amount of lake effect contribution uh, is larger. And the reason, but you could say, well, hey, you said that the winters are getting milder. Uh, we have to have cold air come across the lakes. And that's true. But what's changing is there's less ice and there's more open water. And we have to have, if we have ice on the lakes, it prevents evaporation. And it, it suppresses lake effect snowfall. So this is actually tied with some of those winter temperature trends and the ice pattern changes as well. This uh, pattern, by the way, is also, it's even more evident in the lower lakes if we go over Lake Ontario and Erie, there's even more of, a, of this signal there. So at least for now, lake effect snowfall is increasing. Now in the long term future, it's projected it probably will drop off. But, but at least for now, there's two different trends taking place. Which brings me to the issue of variability. I want to say a few words about this and, and actually look at some numbers, which we were a project we're working on right now. But why look at variability? Uh, why is this important? And, and there's a very, very important reason, and that is that uh, we know from our own human history, and I'm talking now long-term human history, that humans have, have been very, very adaptable, in some cases very, very innovative, when changes in climate around them has been steady, or at least predictable, humans have done, and, and that's reason, reason for hope, I think we've, as we've heard uh, some of the introduction. Uh, humans can be very, very innovative and creative, but when we have changes in, in variability such as extreme events, floods, uh, uh, hurricanes or, or tropical cyclones, hailstorms, those, uh, those adaptations become much, much more difficult, much, much more complicated. And so it's, it's important to, that we, we look at, at some of this issue of variability and how, how, much, how, much flex, or how much variability do we see around a long-term mean. And statistically, again, we're, we're doing some review here for you, brush off your uh, statistics class way, way back when. We know that as climate changes, and if we, we look at a particular variable, let's, let's just assume we're talking here about uh, mean annual temperatures. There's a, it, it, for temperatures, actually it does look just like this. It's a very, very well-behaved symmetrical distribution from our, our lowest temperatures recorded to our highest temperatures recorded uh, over some period of time. We, uh, the climate community uses a 30-year period for this conventionally. That may change in the future because of 
uh, changes in climate, but if you look at shifts or changes over time, it's, it's very, very helpful to look at this distribution and say, well, the easiest thing to do is just to pick up your distribution and shift it one direction or the other. You could say the same thing about annual precip or wind speed, uh, looking at this distribution, but as you look at these distributions, what you can see with that then is there's, there's other nuance here. What, some, of the, some of the most interesting pieces of this distribution are these tails, the extreme events, both the extremely high and the extremely low. What happens to them? What happens to the frequency of those events? Because they're associated with a significant portion of impacts that we care about. And so these are really important. And it turns out that the climate science, there's less known. Because they're, they're relatively rare events, good, which is a good thing, there's just less known about these things. So the simplest way, though, that we could see a change is called just a phase shift of the entire distribution. That's the simplest way of portraying a change in climate. You could also have a change in variability. That's the middle case here, where <coughs> your, your mean or median here stays the same in the middle of distribution. But if it becomes more variable, the tails become thicker, you have higher frequency of these extreme events, both high and low, or case three down here, both of these things happen. So a lot of what's happening right now in the climate science community is, is looking, what, what is the nature of this change? This take, we know we've had an observed change. There's more changes projected for the future. What does this look like? And, and I'll, I'm going to show you some examples of, of what it does. The first one. It's taken from the U.S., and this is looking at the uh, ratio of record high, these are daily record high and low temperatures across the United States by decade from the 50s up to the 2000s. We don't have the, the most recent decade yet. But what you can see here over time is there's been a shift of the, again, we're looking at the very tails of the distribution, but clearly the tails have been shifting upward as that, as that temperature has been warming. We're seeing more and more record high temperatures relative to the past. And so this, this one suggests maybe at least case one, that, that shift, the phase shift is working, but maybe a little bit of, of case three as well. But the warming is certainly moving or picking up our distribution and moving it upwards. It's very interesting to note, because what I'm, I'm going to talk about in our projections, there are uh, projections for increasing frequency of, of heat wave events, several day events with high temperatures. But if we look at this historically, there is not evidence of that yet. Uh, we can, th this is the uh, frequency over the Midwest of heat wave. These are three day, at three day minimum events up in the top 2% of the distribution. And one thing that always sticks out in our climate record here, the 1930s dwarf everything else. We remember they were the driest decade. They're also, uh, the high, many of our high temperature records in Michigan still go back to 1934, 1936 as well. But the bottom line here is that we look at the past, there have been very few trends in heat wave events at this point, even though it's projected for the future. The same is true for cold waves, the exact opposite on the other. You could say for either make a case for both of these or maybe then a little bit of a decrease. But there's, there's a bit more to this. And this is looking at uh, actually an ongoing project right now at the climate office. Um, I'm using data for Traverse City. It's, it's fairly representative, I think, of the state. And we're looking, once again, at a comparison between two 30-year periods, 51 to 80, uh, with our, our current normals period, 1981 to 2010. And what you see here now is the distribution of mean temperatures for the month of January in Traverse City. And what has happened, the dark blue is the, the earlier 30-year the earlier period. The light blue is the, uh, the current normals period. You can see a shift upward. So this is like that case three, where we have both a shift in the mean, and our mean temperature, you can see, is increased. It's about two uh, and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was. Uh, the other thing you can see here with through the standard deviation, our variability has also increased. Now, the intriguing thing about this is, is that we are still seeing some very cold Januaries. There's a still occurring, but they're less frequent than they were before. But what we're seeing now that we did not see last century are some unusually or very, very mild or warm Januaries, winters. And this, again, this, this has agricultural implications. So this definitely suggests that case three, where we see both the change in the mean and the variability. And then I look, we look at extreme, these are the, this is the coldest temperature each year. And what has happened in the distribution of those? Again, here's last century. Here's the current normals period in light blue. This one looks more like a phase shift, but 
the average coldest temperature of the year in Traverse City, you can see typically it's on the order of minus 10 to minus 20 Fahrenheit, it has warmed a full seven degrees Fahrenheit. So that, that's a significant one. It's on the end of the distribution, the end of the tail, and we see this in, in other places as well. Now one manifestation of that directly, if we want to look at a, an impact on uh, vegetation, uh, what you're looking at here, at least on the lower part here, this is the uh, original USDA plant hardiness zone map. Uh, from uh, way back from the early 90s. This was based on 1951 through 1980 data. This index is based in completely on that extreme minimum temperature. And how, how hardy your plants have to be, what do they have to be able to withstand and cope with. And what you see here on the right side is the updated version from the Arbor Day Foundation that came out uh, about uh, four or five years ago. And the, uh, the graphic up here is the relative change between the two. <laughs> All of the, uh, the well, the, the light colors here and the reds are all increases, or I guess a decrease in the need for hardiness. We have gained a full, on average, a full zone of hardiness that we did not have just 30 or 40 years ago. And that, again, that directly relates back to the graphic you just saw with those extreme minimum temperatures. So the warming winters, this is the type of impact that what we would expect and, and we, are, we are seeing. Here's a curveball for you. So if you expect, if the minimum temperature is increasing, what happened to the extreme maximum temperatures? Well, it's decreasing. It's actually decreasing. So the light blue again, uh, or the uh, dark blue, 51 to 80, light blue, 81 to 2010, you can see that it's actually about a half degree or more uh, cooler on average than it was. Very, very interesting. There's a, uh, a little bit of a change in, in variability, maybe a little bit less variability, but some of the extreme maximum temperatures that we saw before have not occurred. And this one we had to do some investigation and look at uh, with a little bit more, uh, well, it, it's, it, it was unexpected. We expected the whole, again, the tails on the, the upper side to, to change as well. But there's a theory, this is hard to, I apologize for this uh, being so small, but it's an intriguing theory. And it's another piece of human, potential human intervention here. This is occurring over most of the Midwest region. This is what you just saw. Actually, in some cases, mean temperatures during the summer season tend to actually cool in places like Iowa and Illinois on average. They have, they're warming, uh, they have much larger increases in the, the cold season, but the, the summer, particularly July, the months of July and August, have, have cooled a little bit. So the question is, well, why? Very few of the climate models and projections are able to see that. A study just done here uh, in the last year or two has uh, shed some light on this, and the current thinking on this is, so what you're looking at up here, these are increases in precipitation across the upper Midwest, including Michigan. This is really difficult to see. We've also seen increases in humidity. Not relative humidity, but actual, how much water vapor is actually in the air. That's increasing as well. Our dew point, another way of looking at that, increases in temperature. And temperature changes here, this is again July and August uh, the, for this graphic. You can see the blues here, actually a little bit of cooling takes place during the same time. So what's going on? Well, if you, you can, you're close enough, you can read over here, this says corn production. What does the landscape look like over much of the upper Midwest? It's, it's where it's one of the most, it is arguably one of the top agricultural production areas of the world. It's intensively cultivated, corn and soybeans, and then other crops in places like Michigan. Those crops require large, large, large amounts of water. And it, it, there's, nat there's enough there in the natural system to do that, but the water's transpired into the atmosphere. And the, the result is uh, what, what the, now the computer uh, projections here and simulations here are starting to strongly suggest is that because we have so much of that crop out over the Midwest we're, and adding moisture to the, to the atmosphere, one, we're getting a cooling because when that water evaporates, it requires large amounts of energy or consumes large amounts of energy that would have gone to heating the ground or the air itself when it evaporates. So that accounts for some of this cooling. There's also a thought that there's even some additional precipitation. So some of the increase in precip over the last few decades may also be associated with this as well. But it's another, it's interesting, it's another human, human related cause uh, associated with large scale changes of the landscape. So that's, that's, and that's, that's still a theory, but it's, it's I think now the leading, the leading or 
uh, cause, or possible cause of, of some of those. Uh, you're going to hear from, from uh, B.J. Bali here shortly to talk more about, uh, specifically about Glisa. The project, one of the research projects or he's working on right now is looking at the nature of increases in heavy precipitation. I'd like to talk about this because if we look at, at economic problems and real problems with, with changes in climate, you, you point your finger directly at heavy precip events and, and flooding. We have, uh, in Michigan, we have many types of, of, of natural, uh, or certainly climatic or weather-related disasters. We have severe weather, we have droughts, uh, we have blizzards. Uh, fortunately, we, we only see the tail end of tropical cyclones, such as hurricanes, but nothing like other parts of, of, of the country. The biggest threat that we have, and it, it shows up clearly with economic impact, is heavy precipitation and flooding rain events. So I want to spend just a little bit of time with that. Uh, BJ's project is looking or trying to quantify how these heavy rain events or heavy precipitation events are changing, how much. And I'll give you an idea here, uh, this table is showing for, for Lansing, and this is representative for, for Michigan. We're looking here at 24 hour, one day rainfall totals with recurrence intervals of 2, 10, 50, and 100 years. So that is defined as a, a rainfall of that intensity would only be expected on average once every two years or once every 50 years. If we look here at the 100-year category for, uh, for Lansing, we can see that back in the middle of last century, this 100-year, 1-in-100-year rainfall event for Lansing area was about 4.8 inches. Uh, in a subsequent uh, update to this particular data set in the early 90s, it increased to 5 and a quarter inches. Now with the current NOAA Atlas 14 product, which is the current gold standard for this, we're up to 5 and a half. So once again, 10 to 15 percent. And what we can say again, once again, very important, both the frequency of, of heavy rain events and the magnitude is, are both of those are increasing. And again, it's about 10 or 15 percent to give you an idea. But it, it, it matters once you get up to that upper tail. Again, there's a lot more impact. It may only be a 10 percent increase, but the impacts are, are much larger than that. I mentioned some positive aspects of a wetter climate. One is that uh, we, the, the amount of drought that we have in Michigan, uh, PDSI stands for Palmer Drought Severity Index. It's an index based on long-term precip uh, trends. Uh, orange color here are droughts. Uh, the greens are surpluses of water over time, again, back to 1895. And you can clearly see that this index, since that time, this is the warm season, May through September, is increasing. Uh, the blue line is the linear fit, and then the red line is a moving average. But it doesn't mean we don't have drought. We do. We actually had a drought in Michigan last year, uh, last, last summer. Uh, and we had a, a quite significant drought, the most significant drought in a long time, in 2012. But on average, they're less frequent and they're less severe than they have been in the past. And again, not to keep harping on this, but if you want to look at really severity for, for dryness, you got to go back to the 1930s. That's still the record for uh, how dry it gets in Michigan. The uh, late the 50s and early 60s were also another very, very unusually dry period here. But with time, because we have that extra 10 to 15 percent additional precip, we just have less drought than we have. And some of the research that I've been involved with shows this directly has contributed to some of the increase in crop productivity in our region. There's, you're less likely to run out of moisture than used to be the case in the past. That's That's at least where we've been over the last couple of decades. One last thing for extreme events, and this is an important one, sets the stage for some of the discussions which will follow. Uh, this also goes back just to 1981, but these are total numbers of $1 billion or more weather-related uh, disasters in the United States, added up. And uh, so in 2018 here, we had uh, 14. You can see it was the fourth highest uh, number here on record, and again, this what's important to note here: this is inflation adjusted. So again, this is just the number of one billion dollar or greater events. Most of these are associated with with severe storms, large uh, well severe thunderstorms, and/or tornadoes. You've also got, of course, tropical cyclones or hurricanes in here. There are some droughts here as well, wildfire. Uh, a couple of winter storms that show up when they hit the East Coast with all the people and so forth, that sometimes shows up. But clear message here, look at this, look at this trend in this event, these events. It's clearly increasing. Now here's the really interesting rub, and that is if we look at the actual frequency of these events themselves, we don't see, some of them there's actually been decreases in some of these events. 
And so if you've got either, some are increasing, but not very much, but what accounts for this increase in the number of these events? And, and it's not a good answer. The, the unavoidable answer is, is that we as humans have more things, more stuff in the way. And uh, again, in, a, in an era when we really need to be thinking about resilience and becoming less vulnerable, this suggests possibly the other, the other direction is, is true. That's, that's uh, it's somewhat frightening. The insurance industry spends a great deal, as you can imagine, of time with these types of numbers, but it is something, it's a big red flag, this one. Uh, so the, the number of problems, especially economic problems that we have related to some of these extreme events, unfortunately, is, is increased. A couple things about the future, and then I, I, will, I will wrap up. Hopefully we can have some, a little bit of discussion. What's projected for the future? Uh, and I, I won't say too much about this, but it's a very, very complicated and challenging thing to do. But the science, the climate science, and it actually has, has now gone beyond climate science. We're talking about Earth systems science, where you have climatologists and oceanographers and, and biologists and economists. I, it's it's a, a, a very, very interdisciplinary type of team that puts together these simulations of the nuts and bolts of the, the Earth's climate system and tries to make some sense both out of where we've been. That's very, very important as well. And then we're, what's projected, given a number of assumptions about the future, and I think I'm going to cut here to, the, to, uh, to some of the, all of the projections for the future, talk about where we've been recently and what's projected for the future, all suggest a warmer world. That's, of course, that's happened here. The uh, image on the top here uh, suggests between a, about a half a degree on the lowest end here of warming to as much as four degrees. This is the global temperature. Remember, we've, we've already warmed a little bit more than one degree Celsius here in the last uh, 100 years. That's, that's the uh, actual part of the graph here. And there's a, a wide range. You would say, well, why is there such a wide range? And it's because, well, there's a number of things you have to assume about the future. And if you think it's tough to forecast weather and longer term climate, talk to the economists about what is economic growth going to be like 50 years from now. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And just as importantly, along with that economic growth, what are we going to assume about emissions of, of these greenhouse gases, which we know are playing a role in influencing our climate? There are a number of scenarios here, you know, representative concentration pathways, that's what RCP, but it, it basically is a scenario depicting a particular type of, of future, ranging from a relatively energy efficient green world in which we have found we've used technology to not only to, to be more efficient with our energy usage, but find ways maybe to remove some of the existing carbon and nitrogen from the atmosphere. That's the lowest the, the lowest amount of cooling. And that's, that's a reminder, too, that, that this thing is, it is fixable, at least from, from all the fear we have, up to the business as usual scenario here. 8.5 stands for that watts per meter squared that we looked at. Remember, 240 is the mean. Eight and a half brings us up here again by the end of this century, uh, on average, at four degrees Celsius. Doesn't seem like much, but again, in that short a period, this is, this is something which is very, very, very rare. We know geologically in the Earth's history. This is the old, uh, the old assessment uh, before that. It's similar. It's, it's actually been uh, a little bit narrower than the one, or a little bit wider uh, than the, the last. Uh, that was from 2007 down in the lower left. So what about the Great Lakes region? What about Michigan? This is our, basically about the same, uh, the same thing except for the state of Michigan. And we have a wide range of, uh, again, of, of assumptions about the future. But you can see that these projections are low. This is in degrees Fahrenheit. So from maybe three or four degrees Fahrenheit warming with the most uh, conservative scenario to as much as 15 or 16 degrees Fahrenheit. That, again, it may not sound like much, but that is a, that is a huge change in terms of our climate. And I think I have next, yes, I do, from Catherine Hayhoe and colleagues. To put that in some perspective, how far would you have to go geographically with current climate to realize a difference that large. And again, depending on what you assume, it could be the Ohio Valley, it could be the Southern Great Plains. And we all have, appreciate how much different climate is there than it is in Michigan. So yes, it doesn't seem like much in terms of numbers, but it is a, a very, very large and profound change, at least in terms of temperature. And along with that, uh, besides the warmer temperatures, more days above uh, 95 Fahrenheit, longer frost-free growing season, 
uh, less, less energy, less needed for heating, more or more energy needed for cooling, um, which brings us to precipitation. All of these, again, the, the temperature is a relatively straightforward one because all these projections say that they all point in the same direction, that's upward. Precip is more difficult, but there's one thing that we know for sure from physics, and that is as the temperature of the air increases, it can hold more and more and more water vapor. So what do you have to have for precipitation? Two things, you've got to have the raw material, that's water vapor, and two, you've got to have a way of lifting that water vapor in the atmosphere to cool it, to condense it into clouds, and ultimately if there's enough cooling into precipitation. And we know from physics that as the atmosphere warms, it will hold, at least potentially will hold more water vapor. It doesn't mean that it, it will be there, but it, it's certainly more, and that this is a major factor, that one of the things that we do know with more confidence. And so if we look at projected changes in precipitation, most of these scenarios, most of the projections, suggest that Michigan will be, in terms of annual precipitation, a little bit wetter, maybe 10% or so wetter in terms of annual precip than it was in the past. It depends on the, the time frame that we're looking at. Here, we're actually looking at the end of the century versus recent, but there's some very, very important flags here or caveats, and this one, the first one is that there's some seasonality to it. And yes, the annual precipitation increases, most of that is because of, of significant increases in the winter, and in the spring season. A little bit less extent in the fall, but look what happens in summer. Over not just Michigan, but much, much of the lower 48, the continental US, that is either level or maybe even less precipitation. If you think about our ecosystems, you think about agriculture, when do we need water? We have to have it in a warm season. That's when, that's when our, 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 those natural and, and uh, agricultural ecosystems need it. This is a big, a big, big red flag. There's a lot of research going on uh, with that particular uh, element right now. Uh, the other thing that's just as important here, uh, again, these are looking at, this is average changes in the annual precipitation, both more heavy precipitation events, and we sometimes hear the statement, both more heavy, heavy rains and flooding and more droughts. And sometimes people say, whoa, that, that doesn't make any sense. And if you think about it, you probably know the answer, there is one, there's only one way that that can happen. And yes, you can have more annual precipitation, but it falls on fewer days. And the word that needs to be used, and I, I, I have a personal campaign about this, uh, certainly in our area, precipitation is projected to become more erratic. Unfortunately, and, and I, unless you sell irrigation equipment, I cannot think of anyone who benefits from that. That's, a, that's another really, uh, that's, why, that's where that statement about more droughts and more, more heavy flooding rain events, and unfortunately, not all, but many of these projections suggest that happens as well. And certainly for our food production system, that, that's, a, that's another major, major problem, potential problem, and, and red flag. Great Lakes, a couple words on those. And this one is actually interesting. Earlier studies of changes in the Great Lakes level here by the end of the century suggested major declines, maybe as much as a meter. That got a lot of attention. A lot, and it happened, uh, when these studies were released, uh, Catherine Hayhoe and, uh, and her, her group, the lakes were, were unusually low. We had uh, actually had vegetation growing out in the lakes and we saw things that we hadn't seen for a long time. Well, guess what's happened since? We've had a rebound, a very large rebound. Uh, subsequent studies to this though have shown relatively less changes. Some of them actually were increases in lake level, some were decreases. And the most recent studies by Brent Lofgren and Drew Grenewald uh, at Glarelt here suggest maybe minor decreases in the long term. But we, the jury's still out on this one. But it's certainly less, at least it's less menacing than we saw from, from an earlier study. One, uh, one though, uh, piece here from, this is from Brent Lofgren's work here recently. One thing he did find, this is looking at water temperatures with depth. This is, this is depth here on the vertical axis. Uh, during the course of the year, one through 365, he did find, this is for Lake Superior, that with these in increasing temperatures, that this vertical stratification of the lake would change, the timing, the overturning of the lakes, the timing of that would change. And just as importantly here, we got a lot warmer temperatures near the surface. Lake Superior has warmed five degrees Fahrenheit since uh, the late 1970s. It's warm more than the air temperature. And try to do the physics on that one. But it, it, it can happen. It has to do with the way the energy is absorbed. But some of this vertical stratification that's suggested by these models is already showing up in some of the some of the observed data. That's 
that and for, for the ecosystems in the lake, this is a this is a big, big challenge. No question about that. Uh, what do we do about this? And again, I'm, I'm trying to basically not a segue to, to much of the discussion that follows. We can either learn to cope with this or adapt to this, or ultimately we can try and mitigate the problem. Hopefully there's a there's gonna have to be a combination of, of both of that given the challenges that we face here. Uh, Two examples, one uh, one not too long ago, many of you, I, I know some of you were even UPR, uh, UP natives, but there was a, there was a, a, well, actually a one in 500 year event that occurred in the Keweenaw Peninsula on Father's Day last year. Here's some, some pictures or images to, from the, the following day. Seven inches of rain in, in uh, about 12 hours, which had never, basically never occurred in that area. Uh, and it caused, caused catastrophic damage. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, was, it was the worst flooding that would have been observed in that part of the state. Uh, there is a, and, and what can be done about this in terms of adaptive strategies? There, there are solutions, and I, we're gonna hear about many of those here today, but just a real quick uh, story. The city of Two Harbors, Minnesota, which is on the North Shore, just northeast of Duluth by about 25 miles. In 1999, they had they had a one in 100 year event that just devastated their, their infrastructure. So there's only about 20,000 people in the town, but the city said, we really need to do something about this. And uh, what they did basically for an $80,000 investment, uh, and it had to do mostly with stormwater overflow, they, they ultimately escaped uh, probably what would be multi millions of dollars of damage. Duluth, uh, just on the lake, which did not have this drainage system, experienced $100 million of damage, but again, a, an investment that is well, well worth the time. Uh, and one last one to leave you with, some the, visually here, Hurricane Michael hit the uh, panhandle of Florida uh, last October, as many of you know, as a, a top end category four hurricane. This is looking at the uh, community of Mexico Beach, and basically much of this uh, was left. It just, there was a massive storm surge, except for one building, actually, except for two buildings, the white building here, the owner of this, three years ago, as they were, uh, I guess they were remodeling, he decided to put in $150,000 of extra strength in the supports, and he put in special windows to withstand a hurricane, realizing it was not a question of, of if, it was when. There would be a tropical cycle or hurricane, and if he didn't think about anything like Michael, but that is the only structure that withstood this particular storm. Again, you can see just devastation. The only exception is, <laughs> The house right in back here, and you could call this the old real estate adage, adage location, location, location. Uh, his neighbor who did not have these was, was downwind, and his neighbors, the neighbor's house blocked the wind for him, and his, his house also survived. But again, another very, very graphic example of, of planning, and, and the, the technology is there. In many of these cases, we just have to have the will uh, to, to use it. It's, uh, it's there. And with that, again, I, I started with warmer and wetter. I'll finish with that. And with one last reminder, I guess I think it's important that many of the projections for the future, they are projections, they, they have limits of confidence with them, but it's important to note that many of the observed trends that we've seen, especially in the last couple decades, are in agreement with those projections. I don't think that's coincidental. It, it gives us a little bit more confidence about it. And it uh, Something, uh, obviously, at least it points us, I think, in the right direction. And I'll land here uh, on the northern, northern uh, Lake Michigan here, thinking of warmer days here, but, but uh, I'll, I'll finish there. Is there time for a question or two? Or you? Absolutely. Well, thanks very much for your time.
That's now going to be in the heritage room. There are maps. I'm sorry. Uh, we're we'll moving. 106 workshop is moving to the heritage room. And the next plenary will be in the heritage room because this room will be set up for lunch. So room 106 is transformed to the heritage room. And the heritage room is when we'll have the next plenary. Um, I think what else I need to add. And then, uh, so get, uh, feel free to refresh yourselves, but move on to the workshop that will start as soon as people can convene there. You have a choice of, I think it's seven workshops for this time slot. Um, Maps, there are maps at the registration.